I take. The, I'm I'm like basketball players. I take my dives on the court. Not even gonna put a dollar amount on this. No. No, I start I start at five digits. Wow. And the last two can't be dollar. It can't be cents. Can't be cents. You gotta have a comma in there. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Let's uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for the opportunity you've given us to look into your word this morning. And uh, Lord, I just pray that um, you would help me to speak clearly, speak uh, from your word, and uh, we'll give you all the honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be in 1 Samuel this morning. 1 Samuel 17 to start. 1 Samuel 17. Um, just to kind of go over... This is our third week in our series on how to biblically deal with depression. Uh, week one, we discovered that uh, God has a plan for our lives and that he wants to use us. He wants to use us, work in and through us, that we would give him the glory and that we would accomplish great things for him. Okay. With that being said, one of the things that will come up happen will come up in our lives is times when we're floundering and not walking right, and times when we are downright discouraged and depressed. Who can tell me one of the two lies of depression? You're all There's by yourself. No Correct. That's the other one. Who has the other? Who had the other one? There's no hope. There is no hope. Yep. Those are the two lies, and we know that. If you know Christ as your Savior, you're not alone. You have the Holy Spirit in you. And uh, there is hope in Jesus. There's comfort in the scriptures. Uh, Romans 15.4 teaches us that. Uh, last week, we looked at the example of Saul. Uh, we saw that Saul had a small start. That is, that he started out humble. Uh, small upbringing. Um, the son of Kish. He was in the uh, smallest tribe. He was a Benjamite. And um, got his, started rising up, met Samuel, Samuel worked, Samuel had gotten warning from God that he was coming and that he was going to be the uh, one whom to make, uh, uh, God was going to have a uh, king for Israel. Then we saw his sinful slide, that is the point in time where in chapter 13, we saw that uh, in a battle with the Philistines, uh, he was to, he was told in a couple chapters earlier to wait for Samuel because Samuel was going to offer the sacrifice and then give Saul word from God on what to do next. When Saul had waited but could not wait but did not wait any longer, he forced himself and offered a burnt offering, which he wasn't supposed to do. And then furthermore, in chapter 15, when God had given him another command, he didn't execute that command, and God said, okay, I'm removing you as king. Then we saw his sin, then we saw his uh, sad state, where is that, uh, no long, he no longer had the spirit of God, but rather he was having an evil spirit. And when Israel exalted David after defeating Goliath, which we'll see a little bit of this morning. That's going to be our first the point this morning. Or yeah, actually, yes. That is, that was true. Um, we see, we saw that uh, Saul, when Israel had exalted David over Saul, when they said Saul had slain his thousands and David his ten thousands, that set Saul off. And from that moment on, he sought David's life. Um, eventually, at the end of the book of uh, 1 Samuel, we see that um, Saul was wounded in battle, and rather than either possibly waiting for any kind of deliverance from David or choosing to deal with the wound, he committed to it. He would ultimately fall on the sword and, and, and thus take his life. And that taught us one final lesson, that a wrong, a wrong response to depression not only takes yourself down, but takes others with you. Uh, this week, I'd like to look at the example of David. 
And I've cutely entitled this one again, David Defeats Depression. Not as cute as last week's title, but <laughs> definitely, but also uh, very alliterative. Um, so the first point I'd like to look at, and all the points this week will not alliterate. I will promise you that. Uh, the first one I'd like to look at is that uh, David defeating Goliath. So I've had you open your Bible to 1 Samuel 17. Now we're not going to be able to read the whole chapter, because the whole chapter is like 60 verses or something like that, pretty close to it. Yeah, almost. But the, the scene's going to start off here is that um, the Philistines have this giant by the name of Goliath. Now, Goliath is a tall man and a large man. Believe it, believe it, it said that he is over nine feet. It's probably, he's probably over nine feet tall. And that's three feet and change taller than I am. And, so, and Goliath would have been larger than I am, for sure, both vertically and horizontally. And he had on this impressive coat full of shackles and had a lot of armor on. He would have had very few flaws about him in ways that he could have gone down. And he challenges the people of Israel when he says, starting in verse 8. In fact, actually in verse 4, he is called a champion. He is, called the, he is the champion of the camp of the Philistines. Height was six cubits in a span. That's where I get the nine feet, presuming the cubit is 18 inches. Uh, verse 8. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Then the story is going to continue on, and uh, we're going to set the scene here. Now, David is the youngest of the sons of Jesse, and he is the, he's a shepherd. He's taking care of the sheep. Let's go skip down to verse 23. Here the Bible says, And as he talked with them, that would have been David, Behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, that would have been the same words he said in verses 8 through 10. Then David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, <laughs> fled from him and were sore afraid. You stand, any of these guys stand, look at there like, You're nine feet tall. I'm, not, uh, I'm out of here. Not David. Verse 24. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this man, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. David saying, I, I want to do this. Note verse 28, though. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake against unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. He's basically saying, what are you doing here? You got no right to be here. Go away. We got, we'll, we'll, we'll handle Goliath. You go tend to the sheep. And David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? Verse 33. Now even, not only was Eliab saying, you got no right to be here. But even Saul would essentially say the same thing. Verse 33. And Saul said to David, 
Thou art not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him. For thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after, out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. When Eliab and Saul both questioned David, not only did David declare, Is there not a cause? And also sought to, de to, do, uh, to defeat the one who defied the armies of the living God. He said, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Who is he to defy the armies of the living God? This was a situation that had all of Israel cowering. David, now here's a guy who is the, not only the youngest of a whole family, he is probably the smallest of the whole family, and he's going to go up against a nine-foot giant? But God is bigger than that giant. And David knew that God was bigger than that giant. And he's going to give God the glory. And he wants to give God the glory even if it meant taking himself down with it. Saul offers David a sword. David's like, I've not proved this. <laughs> what has David proved? Verse 40. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook. We'll stop right there. Five stones. Wonder what Goliath's going to say to this. Verse 40, 42. <laughs> and when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him or belittled him. For he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh under the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies, whom, of, the, the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. And I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And of course, the rest of the chapter is going to go with this battle. David's going to take the stone and put it in just the right place that is going to fell the nine-foot giant. And all of Israel and all the earth will know that there is a God. Who is this Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? When Goliath cursed David, David slew the giant. He took down their champion. When David could have chose depression, he could have chosen it. Because, here's the situation. A nine foot giant. Not only that, but all of Israel was down. They were discouraged. They were depressed over the situation. David wasn't going to choose it, though. He was going to have none of it. He was determined that he was not going to let that uncircumcised Philistine defy the armies of the living God. Who was he? But just some nine-foot giant. When my God is much bigger than he will ever have been. In fact, when he, he could have chosen that, but he chose to fight. And God gave him the victory. And furthermore, it was said of David, in chapter 18, verse 14, that David behaved himself wisely in all his ways. Lord, Note this. Yeah. And the Lord was with him. 18, 14. So first we saw here that David 
When David had an opportunity to be down, he would not let himself be down, but that he chose to fight for God and that God gave him the victory. You can have, when you, when you choose to fight depression God's way, God will give you the victory. David's going to rally 400 men. I want to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 22. We'll read verses 1 through 5. 1 Samuel 22. This is going to be a scene where uh, David is in the midst of one of his escapades because Saul, who saw David no, lo saw David no longer as the guy who played good music for him when he was troubled, but as the threat to his, uh, to his kingdom, David, Saul saw his life. And so in one of these escapades, David's going to escape here. Um, verse 1 of chapter 22, the Bible says, David therefore departed thence, and escaped to the cave Adullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And no verse 2, and everyone that was in distress... And everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented, gathered themselves unto him. And he, that would be David, became a captain over them. And there were with him about four hundred men. And David went thence to Mizpah of Moab, and he said unto the king of Moab, Let my father and my mother, I pray thee, come forth and be with you, till I know what God will do for me. And he brought them before the king of Moab, and they dwelt with him all the while that was David was in the hold. And the prophet Gad said unto David, Abide not in the hold, depart, and get thee into the land of Judah. Then David departed and came into the forest of Hereth. We'll stop right there. At a time when David was escaping Saul, he came to the cave of the Dom and found men who were in distress, in debt, and everyone that was discontented. David took charge. And it was in this cave that David would pen Psalm 57. Keep your finger in 1 Samuel chapter number 22 and turn with me to Psalm 57. I'd like to read Psalm 57. It's only, I think, a dozen verses. And here is going to be a psalm chock full of truth. What a depressed man write down the 11 verses of Psalm 57. When all, his, when all these 400 other men around him were down and discontented and discouraged and depressed? No. Psalm 57. Be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. I will cry unto God most high, unto God that performeth all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. Selah. Contemplate. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. My soul is among lions. And I lie even among them that are set on fire, even the sons of men, whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit before me, and in the midst whereof they are fallen themselves. Selah. My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up, my glory. Awake, psaltery and harp. I myself will awake early. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations. For thy mercy is great unto the heavens, and thy truth unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. Is that a man who's depressed? Not really. no. no. That is a man who is choosing to glorify God. When he knows not what's going to happen, when he knows not the future, he's with 400 other men that are discouraged, that are discontented, but not, our, but not David. Again, he chose the glory in God. 
Now, I also want to note, when David had an opportunity to end Saul's life in chapter 24, he would not. He would spare the king. This is where Saul declares that David shall surely be king. And he'll reiterate again in chapter 26. That's where I'll have you turn to, chapter 26. I want to read verses 21 through 25. Saul is seeking the life of David. But, David. but David's still choosing to give God the glory, despite all the escapades and all the running away and whatever other situation was going on. David, was still, David would not let himself get down. He would be encouraged in the Lord his God. Chapter 26, verse 21. The Bible says, Then said Saul, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do thee harm, because my soul was precious in thine eyes this day. Behold, I have played the fool, and have erred exceedingly. And David answered and said, Behold the king's spear, and let one of the young men come over and fetch it. The Lord render every man his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord deliver thee into my hand today. But I would not stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed. And behold, as thy life was much set by this day in mine eyes, so let my life be much set by in the eyes of the Lord, and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. Then Saul said to David, Blessed be thou, my son David. Thou shalt do both do great things, and also shalt still prevail. So David went on his way, and Saul returned to his place. Now, as Saul would commit, ultimately would commit suicide in chapter 31, after being wounded in battle, there was not an opportunity for David to spare him. Do you think David would have spared Saul's life a third time? Absolutely. Absolutely. Had David had the opportunity. <clears throat> David would have... David. If David had twice, in chapters 24 and 26, the opportunity to slay the one who was after him, but he would not do it. And in fact, even in chapter 1 of 2 Samuel, we see him mourning the death of Saul. I want to see David's eternal promise. Turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 7. Just looking at this real brief. I believe Pastor mentioned this in a message, perhaps the other week. Uh, chapter 7, I want to read verses 2 and going on down. Probably stop at verse 12. The Bible says that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said unto the king, said to the king, Go, do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. And it came to pass that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me an house for me to dwell in? Whereas I had not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought the children up out of Israel, out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. In all the places where I have walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye not me an house of cedar? Now therefore so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight. And have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 10. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness affect them any more as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee the rest from all thine enemies. Also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee in house 
And when thy days shall be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, note this, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. This is an eternal promise given to David. This promise is going to be that he's going to, that his line, that David's line, will descend all the way down to Jesus Christ. What a precious privilege for David. David had no reason to be worried here about building a house for God. Because God was building him a house. Not a house that he was going to have in that life, but a great house for eternity. And a name that's going to carry on forever. Would you like to have a name that carries on forever in a good way? Absolutely. Would it be said by, those by your children, by your grandchildren, by those who you came in close contact with you? Would you have a name that would carry on? Can, will there be a family a hundred years from now winning multitudes of Christ because you won that one soul to Christ a hundred years sooner? <clears throat> Boy, that's a great that would be a great testimony to have. A house forever. And those are souls that will be, uh, be joining you in heaven forever. Now, We've seen a great a deal of good from David here. We've seen David defeating depression in, by choosing to fight for God in, and God giving him the, the victory over the giant Goliath. We've seen David rally 400 men and penning a, one of many great psalms in Psalm 57. And we see David's <coughs> eternal promise. We've even seen the fact that that when David had opportunity to take his greatest adversary, he would not do it. But I do want to see one part of David's life that would be a great... What's the word for it? A great downfall. Turn with me to 2 Samuel 11. I don't want to read the... I'm not obviously going to read the whole chapter... This is going to be part, bits and pieces. Um, in fact, actually, I'm going to skip over part of this. So, um, obviously, I think many of us are very familiar with the story of 2 Samuel 11, how that David's going to st uh, tarry at Jerusalem when everyone else is at battle, and uh, he's going to see Bathsheba, and he's going to desire her, and so much so that he's going to order... His, uh, that he's going to order Bathsheba's husband to be, uh, to be murdered and, and him to take her. I want to note verse 27 of 2 Samuel 11, and then we'll read into 2 Samuel 12 a little. And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Was was any of the was any of what taken place just right? I know we didn't read a lot of the verses. <laughs> David had no reason to desire Bathsheba. David had no reason to go after Bathsheba's husband. David had no right to order anything to be done to him. In fact, Uriah, the Hittite, was one of David's most faithful men. He was out there leading the charge when David should have been out there leading the charge. What had Uriah done to him? Nothing. This thing that David had done definitely displeased the Lord. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. We're starting in chapter 12 of 2 Samuel. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. And he came unto him and said unto him, There are two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing, save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drink of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd, to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. 
And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord the man hath done this thing, shall surely die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Note Nathan's response. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house, and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore thou hast despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thy house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Verse 13. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Here he realizes what he's done. When Nathan called him out, David repented. A good sign is that when you've realized you've done wrong, that's your quickest opportunity and your best opportunity and your first opportunity to say, I've done wrong. I've done wrong in thy sight, Lord. I repent. You get it taken care of right away. You're not going to have time to be. You're not going to have time to be down. You're going to you, you, that fellowship is going to be restored. The fellowship that you have with God through the Holy Spirit. You get right in that first instance. You're not going to have time to be depressed because God's going to because God's going because God's going to forgive that sin. When you have unforgiven sin in your life, that's when you that's the most time that you're going to be down because you're not walking right with God. That's a time when you can have when you can face depression, when you can say, when you think that God's away from you, because He actually is. If you're if you're not walking with Him and you're in sin, but when you get right, when you say, I, "I'm the man," I am the man. I repent. I accept responsibility. I've sinned. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Use me again. God's gonna forgive that sin. If you know Him. God's going to forgive that sin. You're not going to have time to be depressed about it. Because then God, God's going to, still going to use you. If God would stop using each and every one of us after one sin, who could be used? No, not one. But we can be used again. Because we have the, forg we have the ability to be forgiven. Because of what Jesus Christ did for us. David sinned greatly in ordering this, uh, this murder and taking Bathsheba the wife. Yet note here, I want to note in the following verses, that even after losing a child, he's not, he's not going to get depressed. Verses 15, let's start reading in verse 15. The Bible says, And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted, and went in, and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose, and went to him, to raise him up from the earth. But he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth, and washed, and anointed himself, and changed his apparel, and came into the house of the Lord, and worshipped. Then he came to his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive, and when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who can tell whether God may, will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. God, was good. God had comforted David despite this loss. And he knew this was coming. This was one of the uh, this was one of the events that God had said was going to happen as a result of this uh, as a result of his sin. But 
But God's going to give a second son. And then Saul's going to give Saul, God's going to give them Solomon. And Solomon's going to be the one to carry the seed that we talked about, that eternal promise. Building him, building him a house, an eternal promise from God forever. That would have been carried on through Solomon. David had every reason to be depressed. He faced criticism in his own house. He faced criticism from a giant. The king of Israel, that would have been Saul, sought his life. He lost several sons as a result of disobedience. But yet he chose to encourage himself in the Lord his God. He chose to give God the glory over taking any for himself. Even in down moments. And that's what and that's the lesson of uh, that's the lesson that David would teach us in, re, in resolving how to defeat depression. You, you're gonna have Christian, you're gonna have giants of your own life. They may not be nine feet tall, but they may feel like they're nine feet tall. You're gonna have tra you're gonna have personal tragedies in your own life. I've had to deal with my, I've had to deal with mine. You're gonna have you're gonna have times when those around you will seek every opportunity to push every button that you have and get you into a moment of weakness. But you can choose encouragement over discouragement. You can choose to honor God, to give him the glory, and you can defeat giants. You can do great things for God. Does anybody have any questions this morning? No? Okay. Well, um, thank you for your good attention this morning. Uh, you are dismissed. <laughs>